My name is Deanna Parker. I am from Dryden, Ontario. I work at the Suzukau Meno Yawin Health Centre and I plan on starting up an aquatic rehabilitation centre in Suzukau. I'm loving the experience so far. I've met a lot of great people. I've gotten some great advice and I look forward to taking a lot away from here and seeing where uh, it helps me go with my new business I'm planning on starting up. Hi, my name is Rene Michaud and I'm from Ottawa, Ontario and my business idea is to operate a food truck serving Aboriginal cuisine cooked over a wood fire. Well, my name is Taylor Harry and I am launching a sock line called the Sock Durant. Hello contestants, welcome to the Métis Nation of Ontario Generation Innovation Entrepreneurship Challenge. Today, you will pitch your business ideas to the judges. We know how hard you've worked on your business plans, and we look forward to hearing each of you pitch your ideas. Today, the judges will choose the most outstanding business pitch. The first place winner will receive a $1,000 cash prize and a new laptop, computer, and printer. Good luck. The training has helped because just learning off of everyone else around me and just getting different opinions on the way that I'm delivering. I do believe that my pitch has what it takes to knock the socks off of the judges, and I hope I can really deliver on that today. My name is Taylor Harry, and I am the founder of The Sock Direct. This is an exclusive, um, this is a startup venture that is exclusive to the design and manufacture of the high quality, well-fitting dress socks in modern interpretations of classic styles and introducing new, sophisticated, and chic patterns and colors. So the name of the company is somewhat of a playful derivation of the fact that I'm a doctoral student at the University of Ottawa, obtaining my PhD in organic chemistry. So I'm gonna jump in right away. I know you're probably all wondering, why socks? And so the main reason is that it is a stale market. There hasn't been much change in many years and it's in need of rejuvenation. And so I've done some market analysis and most of the, the problems that people are finding with dress socks is the fit and just there's not really much selection aside from your blues, your blacks, your grays, and your browns. And so I'd like to show you guys some examples of some patterns. This would be targeted towards men aged 20 to 50 and more specifically they'd be your your GQ man so someone that is up to date with current trends in fashion and technology and culture so I realize that this is a niche market obviously Taylor how big is that market well the socks and hosiery industry in Canada is recent sales for their annual sales were 135 million and it's about a billion dollar industry in North America so my goal is to obtain about 1% of that, that sales, that market, which comes out to $40,000 in sales a year. Where would you be producing the socks? The manufacturer would be overseas, and so I'm looking at manufacturing in Bangladesh and in, in China. Um, this will help keep my, my cost of goods low, and so because I want to launch as basically an e-business for the first, first year with uh, local sales in the area just to keep a pulse on the market, I'd be able to minimize all my fixed costs and my overhead basically into just the inventory. And so because of that, I'm able to achieve my break-even points relatively quickly. And um, so if I were to launch with 10,000 units. My, my break even point is 1,500 pairs of socks for the year. Just one, one other question. So, you, but you spoke to comfort and fit. That, yes. that, 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 you know, kind of conventional sock that I'm They're wearing. Slip down that, all the time, right? Sure. Or maybe too long. But so, how are you going to fit that, that niche? If you want to serve that niche market that wants a premium product and is doing it in a way that stand, you know, men who want to stand out in their fashion and everything else. Mm -hmm. How are you? Go how do you intend to provide an offering that matches, that provide, that you know, is engineered the way you say it's going to be, and that has the look that you want it to be, and, and really stand stand out when 
you know, and, and keep the per unit cost low. What, what, what is it that you've figured out that, that your competitors haven't? I'm not looking just to get your, your bare minimum materials. I'm looking for the higher end. So, you know, your cashmere, and instead of just getting cotton for summer socks, you know, you're going to get the Egyptian cottons and everything like that. Wow. I think, I think given, given the panel, and the, I'm seeing a couple of GQ guys sitting beside oh, of me. Of course. And, and a gal that can appreciate GQ style. Um, 50 is definitely a bit of a stretch in terms of stretch market, but I, what I've been seeing at most stores is you're going to get people offering, the current offerings are around 30, 30 to $35, and it's for good quality. It started as a niche market that's building up. Yes. Where the momentum builds is that you have people noticing other people's socks and saying, I want those, and they say, nope, sorry, it's a one-of-a-kind item. Yeah. So if you're going to do it, you may want to price into that model the fact that you will be in constant redesign, constant production, constant changing of the style, but that to me sounds more like where you want to go with, yeah, and with that the is model. What I've been thinking with my business plan, just to continue to be. <clears throat> just make sure the numbers back it up in terms of the, that you have people out there that are willing yeah, to spend definitely. that kind of money. Because I'm not there. I don't know. <laughs> These socks? I want to bring you into the. 25 know. maybe. 25 maybe, but not 50. But anyway. Great. Thank you, Taylor. Great stuff. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Well, I really like Taylor's idea. Um, it's very innovative. It's, I think there's definitely a market for it. It went well. Obviously, uh, would always want it to be a little bit better and more polished in the end, but judges were responsive and I, I'm satisfied with how it turned out. I don't have a problem with a premium product. I have a problem with a premium product that's produced like any other product. And what I didn't hear from him and what he needs to figure out for himself is, Am I going to create something that is, that is going to hit that target audience, right? That $50, the person who's willing to drop $50 on a pair of socks and is going to do it not from a major chain? Because that's where you're going to get, that's a different type of competition is the department stores. He's looking for the guys who are going into their local community where they have one or two main, you know, custom tailoring clothes shops where you can get outfitted for all sorts of stuff. And his socks are the ones that everybody wants and they run, and, and so what I was trying to get him to focus on, or what I didn't hear from him, is how he's going to produce that high quality garment, you know, how, and, and, and then he obviously wants to use that as the basis for growth. But develop those local relationships, develop that product that can compete against anything that could be dropped by a major retailer. And I, the only thing that I didn't hear is that the concept, I think I can appreciate, we can appreciate. There's, there is a niche there that can be met, but I didn't necessarily see how he matched up the design with the quality of product with how he's going to distribute it. So, because for me, that's the only way he does compete because the barrier to entry is so low. So that was a bit of a concern for me. I totally agree. Um, what I loved is, I mean, great name, really. <laughs> great idea. He's clearly got a lot of style. I did love his socks. Um, but it does come back to the fashion question for me. So for the end boutique buyer, they want style. They're buying for that reason primarily. I'm not sure we have enough uh, styles to choose from from that buyer. We also, you know, that buyer also likes to have branding. So is there something unique that's not um, easily, easy to replicate with these socks with another, um, with another item? And then of course the execution challenge. So it seemed a bit early stage. So the question around, you know, if I'm a buyer, I want you to get it to me cheaper or more quickly or with better styles. And those three questions I didn't quite, other than the, the cheaper because of the, the mass production, those other two key questions slated to the client weren't quite answered. So for that reason, I would be out with this one. Yeah, you know, I think with style, um, that's, that for him is, is his unique selling proposition. Um, and I think because of the style and the need to change the style, for him to go overseas with production um, is not the right way to go. Because they're used to producing you know, mass quantities, you know, thousands on thousands on thousands. So I think he needs to rethink how he gets them produced. Um, but I like the concept. Um, certainly for myself personally, I, I see a need for differentiating um, sock um, type, um, type options. But uh, I think for him, being able to match himself up with some advisors and to help him with other areas that, you know, certainly from a fashion trend standpoint, he seems to be very well networked, but from a distribution, um, you know, how to get them into stores or how to get them out um, is an area where I think he can find some value in finding a mentor. I think he needs to refine the concept a little bit. 
I'm very privileged to be part of this experience and it's very honored to have been selected to participate um, just because it helps validate that my business is viable. The opportunity is really important to me because um, I'm one of the people I started my business plan and I didn't finish it and I started it again and I didn't finish it and I'm going through everything possible and then so with the support of the Métis Nation uh, Generation Innovation I've actually completed my business plan which is a huge step forward for me. My name is Deanna Parker and I live in northwestern Ontario. Uh, the business I'm proposing to you today is the Sulacout Aquatic Rehabilitation Centre, ARC for short. So being in northwestern Ontario, I don't know how many of you have visited it, um, it's actually larger than the country of France. Um, in there we have uh, 30,000 First Nations people that live in remote communities only accessed by ice roads and by plane. In Northwestern Ontario, we face a myriad of health problems. We have a, a shorter life expectancy than our southern counterparts. We have more increased uh, rates of diabetes, obesity, cancer, and heart disease. So with our northern population that we have, 30,000 First Nations people, for them to get adequate health care, they have to fly into Sulacout, which is the medical hub of the, of the north. So my business idea is to have an aquatic rehabilitation centre. So what I'm going to uh, propose is that uh, it's starting in May 2014 and what we're, uh, my target market is for the elders that come from up north. Um, for many of these elders, this is the last trip that they're going to take based on their physical conditions failing. Uh, generally health problems such as falling, breaking a hip, um, they're no longer stable to go back up north so it's the last time that they'll see their family. As a result, our hospitals are gridlocked and so what I would like to do is rehabilitate these people using aquatics, it's gentler on them than regular land-based physiotherapy. Rehabilitate them and hand them back up north where they belong with their families. Um, so to do this, I'm going to work with a physiotherapist and under that physiotherapist we design specific programs for our elders. Um, it is all culturally appropriate and relevant to them. So I am in the process of learning how to speak OG Cree for them um, so that they can understand it in their own language. Um, so the actual therapy itself I uh, specialize in gait training and lumbar support rehabilitation. And so with that, my goal is to have these people up walking um, with the use of aquatics. So our pool is specifically designed for aquatics. It's a heated pool. It has a treadmill on the bottom. It's got specific workstations for various body parts. Um, in it, there's an observation window that records the uh, session as it happens so that it can be played back for these people to see where they're improving over the course of time. The cost of session is $35 per session. And for most of our First Nations people, they are covered under Health Canada's non-insured health benefits. You talked a bit about financials and some numbers? Some numbers. So to start my business up, it's uh, relatively low for this kind of business, about $175,000. Uh, $70,000 already committed to the project. Um, so for the remaining $100,000 that I would really need for it, I plan to uh, apply for grants and loans through the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund and the Northern Ontario Entrepreneur Fund. Um, and then if that fails, I do have letters of support from Health Canada and the Sulacout First Nations Health Authority. So hopefully that could be used as leverage for a bank loan as well, if needed. So the $175,000 is for the pool itself? And it is for the pool and the building, it's for everything to the entire startup cost. Okay. The pool itself runs about 112,000 and that would just be including upgrades to the facility that I plan to mortgage um, and then just the right regular startup costs, the licensing fees and everything. Okay. Are, are you looking at buying the building or are you... Yeah, definitely buying the building. Um, so there is one that I am looking at and it is completely accessible and it actually doesn't need too much done to it in order to make it a suitable facility. What type of capacity will you be able to put through your pool? Like how many people a day, a week? To start out, I would just let him put, put through about 15 people. That's between myself and another aquatic therapist who works part-time for me. Um, and this is strictly for quality control. We could put through more. We don't want to risk that quality going uh, down the drain because quality is our number one concern. Um, in years two, we're going to do put through about 24 people a day. And then in year three, about 35 people when we have two pools and three full-time staff. So, so what you could be looking at, and when you talk about 24 people a day, it could be it, well, that one person. You could be treating them every day for a matter of... You could be treating them every day, uh, potentially, or I would prefer three times a week just for uh, the healing process to begin within the body. But yeah, you could see 24 of the same people every single day. So you're talking about, so for that one person, mm -hmm. 
who could be there for a matter of a week, you would be making about between $100 and $150 a week from that one individual. From that one individual alone, yeah, paid through uh, non-insured health benefits from Health Canada. Are you thinking of incorporating any other type of rehabilitation for those chronic kind of conditions that you see in that in that population yeah. down the road? Yeah, so uh, with my training specifically, I just do the gait retraining and the balance retraining, falls prevention as well. Um, and then so my other people that I have that are going to be coming on board, one specialized in pediatrics and diabetes and then we have more chronic care um, and sports conditioning as well so eventually we'll encompass that whole thing. Um, for diabetes control and anything like that we don't really need to step in to fulfill that role too much um, just because we have so many other programs and to look out for that. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well that was a great presentation really looking at uh, a business opportunity with a captive market, it's almost a toll gate if you will. You have a great need, build it and they will come. I think they were, they were all pretty positive, so uh, it was good and I seen some smiles and some smirks, so can't be too bad. I really like the idea, I don't see a lot of downside. To me, it's just about having the right employees and managing your risk. Well, I guess this is my Kevin O'Leary moment where I get to say the only downside is any business that requires the government to, uh, to ensure your, your patient flow and all your, your, you know, your cash. Uh, that's a risk, but, but I guess what satisfies my concern is that there are obvious savings. So getting people out of a hospital setting, or at least hearing that, that can, you know, Health Canada sees the benefit of getting them out of the hospital system and, and through her clinic, that, that they see a cost savings and they see a benefit beyond just obviously other health mm -hmm. practitioners in the air saying that there's a need, that comforts me a little bit. And the other thing is, is that if she's telling me that, you know, for every person that comes through the door who's been flown into the community, she's going to basically be seeing about $150, $100 to $150 a week in revenue from them alone. And speaking of not that you hold them captive in the community, but you've got them for a couple of weeks to make sure that they do get the right kind of treatment and then they're back out. It sounds to me like she can, you know, these are, it's a clientele you can depend on. So there are some solid revenue productions. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm on board as well. I, I, I was impressed with the presentation, also her ability to execute. So she's first to market, she's moving with the demographic trends. Yeah. Um, she has a good amount of equity in terms of what she's starting with, with her 70,000. So I really, I didn't have any really huge concerns at all with, uh, with this business model. I would, I would invest in it tomorrow. The demographics work in her favor. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at the at, at age demographics and population, everyone's getting older. There's a captive market for probably several decades. What I like is the very fact that she's she's starting at a you know, low. I, I'm shocked at the low cost to entry. Buy you can buy a building these days for fifty thousand dollars, but if she can do that, retrofit it, build the pool, and and begin there with what it is a, you know a reasonable capital cost in terms of the pool. Uh, and you can build a practice beyond that, I think that's a very good starting point for her. And once she does get herself established and she has, you know, she can go to bank, she can get more money, she can get a second pool. Mm -hmm. So, you know, once she's demonstrated that capability and it's a captive market, it's really a great business to be in. Mm -hmm. great. great idea. So we're all in. We're in. It's been really nice having a company, an organization uh, backing me up. So telling me, yeah, you can do it. Um, we'll help you get there. Um, it's been nice to have that kind of support. I've only recently found out that uh, I am of, of Métis descent, um, so it's allowing me to get to know a bit more about my culture um, while developing a business plan. My name is Renee Michaud and I'm from North Bay, Ontario, currently working and living in Ottawa. And my business is called Food Nation. It's a food truck that serves Aboriginal cuisine on a wood-fired grill. My menu will feature products such as deer sausage, buffalo burgers, uh, white fish served on bannock, um, as well as side salads such as potato salad, corn salad, uh, wild rice. And um, I'll be selling these items at a cost between $5 and $15. Um, we see that on average people spend $10 for lunch and $15 uh, for a meal um, for supper when uh, going to a food truck. And this is a, an industry that is showing a lot of growth and potential. Um, people find food trucks cool, they're going out, they're checking them out, they're tweeting about it and Facebooking about it. Um, in fact, in 2008, there were 83,000 hits for the term food truck um, on Google. And just last year, that's grown to 28 million hits. So people are, are getting out to these trucks. I'll be selling my uh, products to people attending festivals in Ottawa. 
Each year in Ottawa there are 80 festivals and I've selected 36 festivals to attend where I think clients would be interested um, in trying out my food. I will be making most of my sales um, between April and November um, so that's when I'll be working and I'll be out there about 22 days per month. I'm expecting to bring in about $300,000 in sales in my first year um, and that's based on attendance of 1.5 million people at the festivals that I've chosen to attend. Um, so looking to get 2% of that market, uh, 30,000 customers in the first year with that average of $10 per meal, bringing in that much money. I do have the capacity to serve that. Um, I'm going to staff my truck with three people including myself and we can serve 45 people per hour. So just under 400 people in an eight hour shift, a little bit more in a 10 hour shift. So I, I definitely can meet that market demand. From a safety and regulation standpoint, just trying to visualize the truck here, because it's a wood fire stove, right? The way that uh, my truck would be set up doesn't require a special permit. It's not considered a campfire. Um, it's um, strictly for cooking purposes, and so um, that is permitted. In fact, there are two wood fire trucks um, currently operating in Ottawa, so they've passed the fire inspection, which I'll also have to do. Um, but it is safe, it is secure, and, and is um, subject to um, an inspection. Now you touched on an interesting point. So there are two other food trucks operating in a similar wood fire. Mm -hmm. How many food trucks operate in Ottawa? Yes, so there are currently 52 food trucks and carts that are licensed in Ottawa. 40 of those have a spot on the street. So how it works for Ottawa is that you have to actually buy um, a license and sort of rent part of the sidewalk. So 40 of them have a spot set up downtown, whereas I'm focusing on the festivals where there's more people. Um, it bring All of our festivals bring in over 3 million people per year. Um, so there's a little bit less competition on that. That side. But you also need a permit though to operate, is that correct? Yes, absolutely, and that has been factored into the startup costs. And how much is a truck? Yes, so my startup cost for the truck would be around $50,000, everything equipped, um, you know, having the, the, the grill in there and having all the refrigeration, the generator, um, we're looking at about $50,000. I'm really excited, Renee, about uh, the menu, it sounds delicious. And any plans around uh, mitigating the seasonality in your business? So off season, uh, what are you going to be doing with the truck? Is there any other opportunities that exist in market for you there? Absolutely. I would see myself traveling a little bit farther. So taking the opportunity to test different markets in my off season. So perhaps going back to Northern Ontario where I'm from and, um, and serving people during Aboriginal events, during um, Christmas parties and, and doing more private catering during the off season or mm -hmm. going to Florida and taking some time off. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very novel idea. I think Hopefully. she's on to something. Yeah. <laughs> I think it went well. I feel like I had a lot to say and might have been talking a little quick, but hopefully they caught everything and um, took it positively. I was actually wondering if she was thinking of getting into the wedding business. Um, just with, you know, the population trends and, and her off-season challenge, I think you know, food trucks, she could really be onto something here. My bigger concern is her staying in business. So I'm looking at her numbers, and, and right now from what she's told me, so $50,000 $50, for the vehicle, she's gonna do estimated 300,000 in sales. Obviously she's gotta buy product. So I see you've got permits, you've got gas, and yes, the, you know, the stove runs on wood, but the car's gonna run on fuel. So. We know that this is one of the most competitive industries there is. The, the offering sounds great. She's, she's, she definitely has the passion for it, the fire for it. The menu sounds excellent. But this is an expensive business. And for me, you know, yes, she can tap into 2% estimated you know, target is 2% of the market. But she's going to have to work her butt off in order to get, in, in order to keep this truck up and running and provide that kind of offering. So for me, it's a good concept, there's proof of concept, people have been launching food trucks left, right and center. Is there a saturation point? I don't know. Good question. Uh, has she looked in the market, at least in the Ottawa area, to say that this is something that, you know, this is the, the foods on her menu? Well, they're, well I, I support that it, it's, you know, culturally correct and some delicious offerings. Is that what people want? Mm -hmm. And for me, the difficulty in funding something like this is, I'd want to know a little bit more about that. Because you need to know that you're going to be, you know, wetting people's appetites it, going into that market if you're going to move that kind of capital to support a business like this. I'm not, I'm not quite there on the numbers yet. Agreed. All the competitors 
have viable businesses. I think we're all going to make them happen. Um, but uh, I think my pitch was strong. I think I have passion and um, hopefully they saw that and choose me. I do believe that my pitch has what it takes to knock the socks off of the judges and I hope I can really deliver on that today. I don't know. We will see. It's like the old lady that I work with says, what, what happens happens, what'll be will be. Contestants, you have pitched to the judges. They have considered your business ideas and they have made a decision. Whether you win first prize today or not, you have all gained valuable knowledge that will serve you well throughout life. The judges agree that all of you have an incredible passion for your business idea. Taylor, the judges thought you had a great idea and a definite niche for your project. You do have a passion for fashion. The judges see some challenges, however. More work needs to be done to refine your brand so that you can charge a premium price for your product. As well, there are no barriers here to having someone taking your idea and taking it to market. Renee, your passion and commitment for your idea shone through. The judges thought you could have spent more time explaining your costing and profitability. They also wondered if you had done production level cooking. Your concept demonstrates a growth potential, but the market is fickle and your business must be sustainable. The judges recommend that you market test your idea at some upcoming festivals before you start your business. Deanna, the judges feel you have a good business opportunity and a captive market. You are first to market with the clientele you can depend on. You also have sufficient equity to start your business. The judges think you might want to consider scaling your business larger, thinking about the longer term and other possible business opportunities for use of your pool. The judges have made a decision. Deanna, you are the first place winner of the 2013 Generation Innovation uh, Challenge. And I'd like to present you with this check for $1,000. Thank you. Uh, your computer and yeah. <laughs> your computer and printer is going to be shipped to you. Oh, and so printer. Deanna. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations, all of you. Thank you. The Youth Entrepreneurship Partnership uh, Program is a project between uh, the Ministry of Economic Development, Trade and Employment and the Métis Nation of Ontario. Uh, in addition, we have many other sponsors such as the Royal Bank, Union Gas and our own Métis businesses who feel it's important to develop youth. Um, last year's um, third place contestant has gone on to develop his business in photography uh, he now does uh, videography, uh, journalism, uh, and he's out there making money. So um, I would encourage our sponsors to continue to support us and to continue to develop our youth. Our president, Gary Lipinski of the Métis Nation of Ontario, is devoting this year to developing our youth and making them a priority. So we want to continue this into future fiscal years and uh, we hope that our sponsors will stay with us.